I'm Dixie Jericho, and this is Tom Cannon Hello. for Authors Showcase. And today we're talking to David Michael Williams. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, why don't you start out by telling us about your most recent book that came out? Sure. My most recent book is If Sin Dwells Deep, um, and that is actually a parallel novel to my book that came out prior to that one. Um, so it's book two in the Soul Sleep Cycle, and it's a speculative fiction series. And to put it in a nutshell, it's about people who have the ability to go into other people's dreams and all the psychological mayhem that hmm. results from that. You have several books out. You have several tri uh, trilogies, chronicles. I do have a trilogy out, The Renegade Chronicles, which is very standard, I should say traditional, sword and sorcery fantasy. Oh, cool. So adventures with knights and pirates and in magic. So that's, uh, that's very much entrenched in the genre. Whereas my new series, The Soul Sleep Cycle, is a mashup of many different genres. So there's fantasy overtones, there's sci-fi, there's paranormal, suspense. So it's a grand mm. experiment that I'd like to just call wonderfully weird. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, you have a kind of a unique approach to getting your books out. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. I, um, I started an LLC called One Million Words um, because I knew at a certain point that um, I wanted to go have more control, be in charge of my own destiny, now, so to speak. what's an LLC? Um, limited Liability Company. So you started a right. company. So technically, I'm sort of an indie press or a micro press. Yeah, you're um, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but it's still, I follow some of the same steps that anyone who would be self-published would do. I just, in some ways, I mean, I have a business plan, I have a marketing plan. I, I try to keep it at, at a very professional level. Um, and the LLC, setting that up was part of... Um, was part of keeping myself uh, on task with, with keeping a high caliber of quality, but also for some legal protection. Okay. Yeah, uh, there's many avenues that people can go, you know, if if you're going to go self-publishing, but it seems like that is a a good way to do it, you know. And so you have your own publishing house, so it's not uh, like it doesn't say create space. Right, yeah, that, there's, there's some advantage to doing that. I often wonder how much people really look at who the publisher is. True. I think True. some people do. I think yeah. there, I mean, there is still somewhat of a stigma of the self-published mm -hmm. author because if anybody can do it, then everybody can do it and quality is all over the board. So I, I do think there are those who look for the, the publisher name. But, but you sound, mm -hmm. sound more like you've got a marketing plan. Tell us about the um, business plan and the marketing plan and why that worked well for you. Because I think sure. most people just write a book and then are like, oh my gosh, what do I do? Mm -hmm. But you sound like you've put thought ahead of writing. Yeah, I think part of the advantage for me was I had books ready to go. So I mm -hmm. kind of can switch gears. I still want to be creative. I still want to have you know, productivity on the literary side. But because I had a trilogy that was waiting to go and, you know, agents didn't seem to be interested in representing it. And I'm like, I know I'm going to um, try self-publishing if, if, if I don't get any bites on the soul sleep cycle. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I had three books and I could take some time. Do I put them all out at once? Do I do them one at a time? Do I start with paperback and then mm -hmm. do... And so then you did a lot of research? Yes. I was going to say, yes. how did you figure all this out? <laughs> just by a lot of research. I... I'm in some ways fortunate that I, I really glom onto the creative right side of the brain, but then there's a part of my left side of the brain that loves organization <laughs> and spreadsheets. And uh -huh. uh, so for me it was, okay, I know what the end result is. How do I reverse engineer so I can create the product I want? But then you're right, then there's the marketing, there's, you know. And what's, what's fascinating about the self-publishing is there's so many things that rely on other things. So I can't tell my cover designer the dimensions for the cover till I know the spine width. Well, I don't know the spine width until I lay out uh, the interior to at least a certain oh, degree so I know the width of the spine. And, and then I can't get them the, the uh, UPC on the back, the barcode, until <laughs> I know what the price is. But I don't know the price until I know how many pages my book is. So there's wow. a lot of That's moving lot. parts yeah. to keep track of. And, and it's, it's a challenge, but every time, I, every time I do it, it becomes a little bit easier until they change how something is done, <laughs> yeah. such as the recent announcement of Create Space going yeah. away and becoming all Kindle, Kindle yeah. and yeah. So, but, <laughs> so. yeah. And 
not necessarily bash people create space. I actually have a book I, I got I made to create space and it can be a good tool. Oh absolutely. But it just seems like uh, like you said the agents weren't looking at it and agents and publishers are looking for something that's very marketable. Mm -hmm. So if you know if you know that if you have something good to that can write, it's just you have to create your own market. You do. And your own readership, then LLC and uh, kind of creating your own little company has a lot of advantages. So what, yeah, what are the advantages of doing it that way versus just doing a create space? Well, um, to be completely transparent, I have been using create space. Okay. So mm -hmm. create space, like you said, you can either let create space put their name on it if you don't want to buy your own you know, ISBN, if you don't want to you know, buy your own barcodes, you can just say, hey, create space, take care of that. It's mm -hmm. cheaper. Um, but again, there's the there's the perception of sure. being and, professional and, and, and getting it into bookstores. Bookstores don't typically want they, it. No, they don't. And you know, walking into a books a million, and I say, hey, I'm a local author. Do you want my books? Well, if you're not through our main distributor, keep on walking. We can't do anything for you. Yeah. So they legally can't you can't take your book. right. Yeah. And there was you know a book world where in in Fond du Lac where I lived for a while uh -huh. and. When in there talked about selling on consignment, that's an option. But when you look at the percentage they take, you, it's really a lot of weighing the benefits. And is it worth my time for X amount of profit per book sold mm -hmm. to do that when you know most people are buying things online? And so you do lose out by you know whether you're a self-publisher or an indie publisher. There are certain avenues that become much more difficult, or you have to price things a lot higher in order to actually make mm -hmm. money um, per yeah. unit. Yeah. <laughs> so it's 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 a lot of research. The research doesn't end. It doesn't it doesn't ever end because things are They're constantly changing. changing. It, yeah. Absolutely. So your advice to somebody who's thinking about going self-publishing would be just to research and have a marketing plan. I take it. I definitely would say yes to a marketing plan. Um, I think there could probably is nothing more discouraging for someone who is very creative and, and has poured their heart and soul into writing a book and then putting it out and saying it's available and then there's crickets. Yeah. There's no oh, yeah. sale. I think I think if I had done that, you know, in my twenties, when, you know, some of the early drafts of my novels were done, I would have just been devastated. Um, so I do think that if you are planning to do this alone, if you're planning to be a self publisher, you are also a self marketer. You're also a self promoter, and and you you have to approach it with some level of business savvy. Mm -hmm. As far as whether or not to set up an LLC, I think that really depends on one's goals. If I'm someone who has written sort of something that's autobiographical and I want to put it out there, I know my family's going to love it, and I know there's you know a circle of people who will oh, want okay. it, and I'm putting my story out in some way that's consumable. I think maybe you don't need to. Mm -hmm. But if your goal is to continue to produce and you're looking at the long term and building up on the successes of the others, I think there's there are definitely some advantages to, to to doing that. And I alluded to you know the legal side of things. If I'm putting out putting out books and there's any any sort of liability, I don't want there to be you know losing my house or no, <laughs> affecting oh, my yeah. livelihood. You know my, my family. Well, for example, before I did um, did these books, my wife and I as a passion project. Um, wrote a children's book and it was it was a passion project but we also knew hey, we want to uh, we want to put this out into the world um, at that time I you know my agent was still trying to get some sales on the other side but I wanted I wanted to know what my options were so this was a good experiment to mm -hmm. see um, how all this worked and the book came out and it was out for no more than a couple of months when we were told well your title character who's in the title of the book and mentioned mm -hmm. all throughout um, that the word we thought we made up is actually trademarked and you're in violation well wow. and you mm -hmm. hear I mean you hear all the time well you don't have to worry about titles because you can't copyright a title yeah mm -hmm. but if there's a you know if I say I hate coca-cola is the title of my book I'm oh, pretty sure yeah, coca-cola yeah, is gonna have you. a problem <laughs> with that so even this word we thought we had made up Wow. Someone else is saying it protecting their rights, which they they ought to do. Otherwise, they'll lose their trademark. So there's just right. you don't know what you don't know. So yeah. I wanted to have some level of protection. So I didn't, you know, my first series, The Renegade Chronicles. I have so many names that I've made up, places mm -hmm. I've made up. So you bet you I go you do. right. Yeah. <laughs> so I go through the trademark yeah. database for all of those terms, wow. even just oh, really? even just common names in in my new series. Even you know these are. You know, Vincent Cruz is my name, my main character. If there's like a Vincent Cruz brand something, 
I should know that before I try to put that out there. That's mm-hmm. fascinating. So again, I, I I think it was one of those very unlikely things to have happened, but I'm not going to let it happen again. Well, so a mo- yeah. experience. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So tell us about your marketing plan. What does that look like? How how many years does it stretch and how long have you been doing that? Sure. My marketing plan tends to be wrapped up very closely to my business plan. At the end of the year or very beginning of the new calendar year, I will take a look at, you know, what my goals are. Like what what are my production. So I knew in 2018 I was going to have a book come out in quarter one and a book come out in, in quarter, you know, early quarter four. So wow. and then I have to like map out, well, what do I do in between? I can't just only talk about my books right when they're coming out. There has to be things to sustain interest and gain followers and build excitement throughout. And so it becomes a lot of filling in holes and then just trying new things. It's, Are you on Facebook and Twitter? And, and Yep. Yeah, I do. I do those, like the big social media. Uh-huh. And why don't you give us out like your Twitter handle and sure. other uh, social media where you're, you can be found at. Oh, absolutely. Um, on Twitter, I'm numeral one million words all together and then on Facebook I'm one million words spelled out unfortunately Twitter didn't have the spelled out (laughs) one available at the time Um, otherwise on Facebook you can just look up David Michael Williams author and you have your own website I do blog on there I do yeah um, David hyphen Michael hyphen Williams dot com although one million words with hyphens dot com will get you there as well (laughs) because it's a publishing company there's been for me, yeah. this, do I have a separate website? But since I'm only mm-hmm. doing my own things at this point... So you're not publishing anybody else's no, stuff? No. I've had, I've had people inquire. Oh, absolutely. And, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, uh, that? I spend a lot of time thinking about that because I've helped people publish, self-publish, and, and get their books ready to self-publish as a side gig. I still put that money toward one million words, my company, mm-hmm. but I don't put my company's name on it anywhere. And for me, it's, it's, it's a very big step. And what prevents me from saying, okay, well, Dave, you know, one million words helped put out this, this, you know, world, you know, the Great Depression memoir that my friend had written is I don't necessarily want to open those doors. I'm, I'm a publisher because I'm a writer who wants to have his books out into the world. I'm not a publisher because I want, I want to spend my time publishing a ton of things um so in some ways it's a little bit selfish um because the more i'm doing you know the the production side of things the the marketing side of things the less time i have to create new fiction so the my writer time shrinks so if i'm going to be what they're calling now these hybrid publishers where well i have my you know workflow set up i can help other people get their books out um I'm just a, I'm just a little bit too selfish with my time because then I'll be a publisher, not a writer. Well, yeah, you said you have a book out first quarter and fourth quarter. Yes, Those are pretty, pretty <laughs> big books. How much time do you spend writing? Where do you do it? You know, What's your schedule. You it's full time right now. I actually have three quarters time now. Okay. On Tuesdays, I work completely on the one million word side of things. So, so Tuesdays an eight hour day. On the yes. Side. Yep. And then I get a few hours, kind of other evenings after I pick the kids up from school, where I can jump in and, and answer emails and and be active on social media. Mm-hmm. The the other side of why I haven't opened one million words up, you know, because I'm part of a writers group. I know there's some really good stories and people mm-hmm. who want to have books out and. So I'm always happy to help as a resource, you know, like, hey, let's go yeah. have lunch and I'll talk you through the process. Um, or, you know, if you need someone to be your proof proofreader, I'm happy to do that, you know, for a certain cost because that's taken away from from other sides. But because I'm still learning so much on the marketing side, yeah. it is yeah. such a, a – I work in marketing as my day job, but uh-huh. book marketing is an alien <laughs> compared to some of the other, um, you know, B2B and, and, and business-to-consumer type marketing. Um, I just would – I, it's becoming an accepted business model, but there's a part of me that's like, I don't want to have this beautiful book come out with your name on it, and then no one buy it. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. I, I don't, I don't have the formula yet. I don't have the inroads mm-hmm. yet. So I feel like I need to maybe get a little bit farther along with my own stuff before I could turn the page, so to speak. Right. So the, somebody comes to you, and you're like, Oh yeah, I'm going to take this, and right. I'm going to do this, this, this for you. You know, because there's risks in anything. Right. So. And I, I know my publisher is an Amazon associate, so they have some pull that a normal person wouldn't have on Amazon. Right. So when my publisher has my book, they're able to give it a little boost, too, right. that a normal person maybe, you know, just putting out their own book isn't able to do. Yeah, so it, it for me, I, I would just feel 
but, but it's a viable business model. You're hearing the term hybrid publisher. Yes. You're hearing oh, yeah. so many people do it. We will get you this great book, and then you're on your own. Or we can make some suggestions, but we're not doing the marketing. I just feel as though maybe you're, maybe that's setting someone up to fail. Or yeah. I just feel, it's I would feel that. Right. <laughs> yeah. And it, and it is good for some people. I mean, yeah. it, it's a way to get your book out. It's a, it can be a step. But at th that point, then you become trying to, it's not a vanity press, but you're still, those people are trying to make money right. from the writer. Oh, absolutely. Reader, it's it's right? very close to the, the old vanity press model, except you don't, because of print on demand, you don't have to have boxes and boxes of your own book in the basement. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, and again, it, has, it comes down to everyone's individual goals. If I am someone who, I, you know, I wanted to write about my grandparents because they have this great story, and I know I want all my cousins and aunts, you know, yes. and, you and the book, book needs yep. to exist, why not? Like right. that, that, but if it's, if you're trying to be a commercial success, if you're trying to build a business that, you know, is yeah. profitable, I, I, I just struggle a little bit with that. Maybe someday, but right now I, I have too many stories I want to tell and yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to take any more time on the production side if I don't have to. Yeah. I definitely see people that have a clip, maybe the stories, maybe they're kind of the memoirs mm -hmm. or there's some people that have their poems and they collect it. And then they have like a Kinko's, which is fine, yeah. you know, a spiral bone. But for the same price, you know, go through Create Space or go something and you could have a permanent bound book. So why don't you tell us a little bit how you got started writing, how did you get interested in writing your, say, genre, but mm -hmm. you kind of mix them all together. I do. I started writing um, very straightforward sword and sorcery fantasy because that's what I grew up enjoying reading before I knew fantasy was a genre mm -hmm. you know I you know I'd be watching certain cartoons I'd be you know certain comic books would appeal to me more and I, I didn't know the term science fiction necessarily mm -hmm. or fantasy it was just there were certain supernatural things going on that I found fascinating and then you know I think it was probably high school I discovered Dragonlance books which are kind of Dungeons and Dragons based oh. fiction yeah. and I never had played Dungeons and Dragons at the time but I saw a book with a dragon on the cover and some warriors and I'm like well what is this so I, I picked it up and, and I well, wouldn't have said I was a huge reader before that but after that mm. I certainly was mm -hmm. um, paired with that is I think I've always had just this innate need to storytell like the storyteller in me and before it was writing it was drawing pictures or play acting with you know action figures or legos and and just telling stories that way but i think you know as high school went on i realized you know my, these are not going to last like mm -hmm. if i'm drawing out my story and then throw the you know and it's just the scribbled mess yeah. with this convoluted it yeah it is impermanent so i i needed something to record the stories that were in my, that i was coming up with and writing writing was the most efficient way to do that and at the beginning i thought like well I, I'm, a, I'm an idea guy but uh -huh. i don't really have the writing chops like i'm i'm really just detailing things that happen but i'm not thinking in the you know, mm -hmm. first act, second act, chapter, mm -hmm. yeah. novel, series, like your, my brain just wasn't working that way. So then it was freshman year of college that I, you know, really kind of made that decision of, I really enjoy this. I, I want to tell my stories. I think, I think I'm getting better at this writing yeah. thing. <laughs> so I majored in English. I did a couple independent studies where I worked one-on-one -on -one with a professor and actually the very first draft of some of the early parts of my first novel, Rebels and Fools, came out of that wow. and it was teaching me to chapter a week while that's writing on a deadline yeah. yep. getting instant feedback and putting myself in the the reader's shoes something that i think is very difficult to do i was exposed to it very early on because i mean i had a built-in beta reader and that professor and certain words that had never would occur to me that didn't make sense or wouldn't be the mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. one to use or did, wasn't conveying what i thought it conveyed so it was a uh, it was a, a, a very good education experience and and I just never stopped writing from there. It was one book into the next, into the next, and helped me build up sort of a quote-unquote back catalog. Mm -hmm. So then when I got to the point of, okay, I'm ready to, to publish these, enough time had passed where I could be very, uh, very, you know, unbiased on it. It, it actually... You go back and read it later. Oh, absolutely. The, the first novels in particular, they, they were so bloated. They were like, uh, you know, when you start writing a book, I don't know that there's anywhere that tells you, or unless you specifically think to look for it, well, if you're writing this genre, and this is the first book in a series, it should be this many words. 
I think you probably could find websites now, but yeah, at the time, yeah, yeah. I just thought I'm going to write the story that needs to be told. I'm in college, and there's you know the more pages the better for college assignments. <laughs> <laughs> so it was 175,000 words wow, for book one. That's huge. Wow. And I cut out 50,000 of those words before all is said uh, and done because they it yeah, didn't, yeah. didn't though because it made it better. Yeah. And with so much time passing in between. I really felt as though I was an editor looking at someone else's work. Mm -hmm. It was an earlier version of me, so I, I could be very impartial <coughs> and just, in some ways, merciless to yeah. make it the best story it, it should be. So, do you have um, a group of beta readers now? I do. Um, of course, there are certain family members that get to see stuff earlier. Have to. Yes, <laughs> my 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 wife is my alpha reader, which in some ways is an unenviable position because she sees the worst of my writing. Mm. She sees it in its roughest form. And then when you know the finished product is done, she feels she's already read the story, or may, yeah. I mean, things may have changed in some significant ways, but in her mind, the first time she read it is the story. So I, I always feel bad because she's doing me a huge service, and, and there are times where I'm kind of grumbling, writing down notes, like, no, she's wrong, I'm not going to do this. And then a couple of days later, I look at it, and ah, oh, she's right. Yeah. So, so I would say my wife, Stephanie, is my, is my alpha reader. I belong to a group called Allied Authors of Wisconsin, hmm. which is kind of a southeast, uh, kind of Milwaukee-based. A lot of our members are mm. in Milwaukee. I'm in Fond du Lac, and we're getting more and more Fond du Lac members into the group, so we're kind of spreading. But that's a, it's a writer's group where we will bring in chapters of a work in progress or a short story. Do you guys meet in, in person? Yeah. We do, yes. Oh, wow. And, and I think there's a lot of... I, I know things are going more and more electronic yeah. and, and I think that that's incredibly helpful because you can find people who are in your genre you can find people mm -hmm. who are farther mm -hmm. along a little not as far along as you and but um, this group I think is in some ways incredibly special not only because it's one of the oldest writing collectives so there's a lot of longevity mm. um, in, in the group but it's in some ways a support group in that everyone genuinely wants everyone else to succeed and I think every once in a while whether it's like a you know I'm thinking of some college workshops and things oh, where yeah. it's fun to tear down because it makes you feel smart. And, yeah. and and I think there are people who approach it as, you know, in an almost condescending way. But I think at Allied Authors, everyone is really, it's, and it almost always is punctuated by, it's your story, do what you want to do, mm -hmm. this is just my opinion. Um, and and I think I've, I've become a, a much better writer because I've been a member now for, well, more than a decade. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they, you know, read... If souls can sleep, so they read the it. whole thing or just certain chapters that no, you're struggling with. No, we, you can yeah. kind of do it any way you want. I've always liked to do it chronologically, and there are challenges. And I always say, like, oh, you poor people, like this book mm -hmm. has a it's, a it's a complex novel, it's a complex series, and if you're only hearing it chapter by chapter once a month, it's hard, yeah. details fall. We have a website, okay. you know, where, mm -hmm. where members only can kind of go in and, and see outlines and try to refresh their memory before a meeting, um, but. Given those constraints, I still think it's incredibly valuable. There are people who are writing in my genre, and even those who aren't can help with things like word choice or like that. Just you lost me here, and mm -hmm. and and, mm -hmm. and in some ways, like writers are very good critiquers. But I also think we we've had you know spouses sit in on meetings and people who aren't writers, and sometimes readers give you even better feedback than the writers do because the writers, well, this is how I would approach it. Right. The readers yeah. like yeah. I just. You know, I just think the story is cool at this part, and this didn't work for me. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about uh, where you got the one million right, one million words. Sure. So, one million words. Um, actually, the the gentleman who invited me to join Allied Authors, Tom Ramirez, he uh, always had this joke about how anything before your one millionth word is just finger oh, exercises. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. It's like you got to do a, a million words and then your stuff will start being good. And so he, he challenged me on that because he met me as a fairly young writer and, mm -hmm. and he had, had many, many books out by then. So I, I did a tally. I went through all my oh, word oh nights. My I'm like, I got to see if I've done it, if I'm there yeah. yet. And I was yeah. happy to report it. At that point, even I had crested the, the one million words mm -hmm. mark. So... Um, to think about that. Yeah, so I, yeah. I, and I don't know. If, I mean, I think it's it's a it's a fun proverb, but I yeah. everyone but, but it's is, everyone to is keep it in your mind. I believe and instead you of need more words to you know, smooth it out. They started writing. They wrote their book, and then mm -hmm. they're like, "Here it is. Here's the the next right. greatest American novel." And well, you hear things about like an author's voice. And when I first started out, I didn't really know what that meant. That's a tough thing. I didn't really, you know, it's like I have a story I'm going to tell, and and I think. You know, as time goes on, you sort of, you develop habits, 
And I don't think that means you always have the same voice or they're, you know. But I think there are certain things you look at and you're like, oh, I can recognize that this is the author of the book because of how they're telling the story, their, you know, way of weaving the language. And I do think that if, you know, maybe it's only half a million, I don't know. But I think you have to put in a lot of pages before you start to understand your voice as an author. Otherwise, it, it's a little bit, you know, you don't have that same finesse. So so that was part of it. It was almost an inside joke of, the, you know, one million words. And then, you know, lo and behold, they say the English language has roughly one million words. And so I just, I just thought it was, and actually I was using one million words as my blog before I had anything out because mm -hmm. they tell you build your writer platform before yeah. you even have anything to right. really contribute or sell. Um, so I was writing my blog, and a lot of it was writing tips and kind of uh -huh. audience to other writers, not necessarily mm -hmm. readers. How often do you up to, uh, do a thing on your blog? I um, I will do a monthly blog post. One monthly. One month, so about roughly 12, 12 year act. You know, sometimes I'll deviate, and there might be more than one, or I'll do a short one. But I think that's really all people would need to hear from me. <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put yeah. things out superficially. So I try to be strategic and right. and try to add value where I can. So once a month, and and I used to write a newspaper column, and so for me it's like I, I enjoy that creative nonfiction, mm -hmm. and it's a slightly different way of writing, so um, I, it's something I look forward to doing. So if somebody were to go to your blog, what types of articles would they find? Well, more and more lately, I'll, I'll still put things out there about, you know, it's more, not necessarily as many writer's tips as I used to, mm -hmm. but what I, but I, I do think writers could appreciate it as well as readers because I, I try to explain, like, well, this is what it's like being a writer. This is what, this is what I'm doing now, and this mm -hmm. is why I'm doing it. But a lot of it now is more focused to people who have read things I've written so they can keep up with, well, what my projects are and <coughs> what the next major release is going to be, mm -hmm. but what other, you know, events am I going to and, and things like that. So it's, it's in a bit of a, a transition phase um, of, you know, kind of a wider audience, but more focused on what I'm producing versus just maybe more conceptual writing. How topics. many words do you write a week? <clears throat> I'm you, still stuck on this. I'm going to have a book first quarter and fourth okay. quarter. Because it takes so, me forever. So when I was doing my, my business plan for 2018, I realized that this was going to be a very production-heavy year. Um, I could have just done one book release a year. Um, and you know, put the next one out in 2019, the third book out in 2020, yeah. and and then I would have had more time for writing. But looking at what I wanted to accomplish, I knew that I was going to do almost no new fiction writing this year, which is a little depressing on some level yeah. because yeah. That's what you as a writer, do. that's that's you know, but you have to weigh these things. And I mm -hmm. I decided that because the Soul Sleep uh, Cycle series is is somewhat complex and there's a lot of moving parts. I didn't think it would do me any good to try to squeeze another project in between. Mm -hmm. So I decided to be a little bit more aggressive with the publication schedule so I could get that out so readers wouldn't have to wait quite as long for the next installment. And I could... Because they've got that world in their mind. Right. So, you know, if I have, you know, nine months in between releases versus, you know, 12, 15 more months, it's helpful for them. It's helpful for me because I can stay entrenched in the world and make sure there's continuity and I'm getting, you know, following up on themes from beginning to end and, and it's a comprehensive, satisfying series. So it was a sacrifice. I did I did squeeze in a short story, though, that I actually got really good feedback on and people are like, that so should be... you put that on your blog? Or? I did not oh. um, because I, you know, I have... I have ideas. I have. <laughs> they, they told me like, well, that would be a great chapter one for your next novel, and mm -hmm. I, I have other ideas. I'm like, okay, well, it's good to have options, and you know, I have a handful of short stories. I, I do mostly long form fiction, but mm -hmm. I have a handful of short stories that I think are are with a little bit more polish are would be a, maybe a nice collection. So then, well, maybe that's save them. maybe that's the end of 2019, or maybe that's early 2020. So I, it's always just these. My spreadsheet is just insane. I don't know how many tabs I have, but one tab is all the things that I'm doing all throughout the rest of the year. So you're doing it on Excel. I am, okay. and then and then there's things just more broadly. Like, well, I know the third book in the series, If Dreams Can Die, is coming out spring 2019. So right now it's just one line, but when I get to there, it's going to become 50 lines of more probably of tasks that need to be done in order for that to be mm -hmm. published. So it's, it's, I just put, you know, ideas of like, well, this is happening. This is pending. This might happen. 
Maybe someday there'll be audiobooks. Maybe someday mm -hmm. they'll be translated into Spanish. I, so I have like kind of my stretch goals and wish list. So there's always oh, something I can do. You're gonna have to doing. do that yourself because you're the publisher, right? True. Except you know, I, I have a I, I'm blessed to have a stepmother who speaks very well Spanish. Huh. Um, she's Mexican, so she has even offered to do some translating. So nice. Like um, that that could be an option, and the, and then audiobooks because they're skyrocketing. I'm, yeah. I'm definitely mm -hmm. keeping my eye on that option, and I know. Um, Smashwords has a partnership, um, and I use oh. Smashwords as an expanded distribution for ebooks, so I can hit mm -hmm. Kobo, iBooks, Barnes yeah. and Noble, um, and I was looking at the different models they have for there. Of you know, you can do a flat fee, or you can enter in this partnership. But there's, it seems like there's some upfront costs there, mm -hmm. um, where again I'd have to do some more research and evaluating and see is this going to help. Is, is the cost going to be be worth it? But I I expect I'll probably be dipping my toe into that at some point just because it's an explosion. And then somebody else would be reading your book? Like, like yes. On or the words. author could read it. The author could read it. Um, I've, again, <laughs> done plenty of research, and there are people yeah. who said no matter how you know airtight I tried to make my room and the equipment I got, it just did not have the quality mm -hmm. of professional voice actors. And, and that's something that any... You know, self-published or indie-published uh, author needs to decide is how much are you willing to do yourself. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's like there was no doubt in my mind that I was going to find someone else to do my cover. I am not a graphic designer. Yeah, I yes. work and have worked with incredibly talented graphic designers, and I think it's very easy to spot when an author tries to stretch beyond their their skills. Oh, yes. And the I mean, cover was the, it for you, huh? The cover. It's like <laughs> I mean, the cover is your biggest marketing yeah. platform yeah. there is maybe I mean arguably even more than the title mm -hmm. so I, I I knew I wasn't going to try to do that myself I wasn't going to be my own proofer because I'm never going to find my missing words or repeated words or so homophones. do you hire that out somebody I do I do have someone who actually is is, is doing it as a passion project mm -hmm. so again mm -hmm. I can save a little on cost there it's something she wants to do and kind of maybe build a portfolio so we're helping mm -hmm. each other out at this point but Audiobooks, I, and again, I think even if I invested in the right equipment, mm -hmm. you know, even if my voice is pleasant enough for someone to listen to for hours after, you know, hour upon hour, mm -hmm. um, is that where I want to be spending my time? Yeah. Um, so it's a time money balance. So I, I, I think there are people who have it down to a science who are incredibly skilled at it. I think that's something that I would be more inclined to outsource. Mm -hmm. So with indie publishing, mm -hmm. you have the advantage in that you have the control. And you don't have to worry about. You want to take have an audio book. You don't have to worry about somebody else. You can make that decision. Right. And on, on the other hand, you will have to invest. It's a money investment. Oh, absolutely. It, and and there are people who I, you, know, you hear horror stories of like I hate my cover art. Like I, I hate it, but the publisher knows what sells, and it's like there. How much control are you willing to give up for me if I don't like something on my cover? Well, my cover artist is someone I work with at, at a marketing agency. I can just holler across the <laughs> hall and say, um, can we try a different typeface? Or uh, I'm thinking, you know, we need to try this instead. And yeah, I don't have any control over my cover. They yeah. show it to me and they're like, this is the cover. I'm like, yeah. okay. And, I'm, I, it <laughs> might, and, you know, maybe they, you hope they do know what they're doing. And it, and it might be obvious right by now, but I'm a little bit of a control freak. So, <laughs> no, so no, for, no, me, it's, for me, it's, 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 I'm, you know, no matter what, I'm in control of so much of what I do. Unfortunately, sales are not something I have direct control over, the marketing I do, but not how many books I actually sell. Yeah. Um, but everything up until then, it, the successes are mine to claim and the mm -hmm. failures are mine to claim. So. so what are some of the ways that you sell your book? I know you went to um, the Fondue Fest yes. recently. So <laughs> every, you know, year when I'm doing my business plan, I look, okay, what, what was successful? What seemed to work? Well, with the Renegade Chronicles, I tried some very grassroots marketing efforts, and by grassroots, I mean free. Like, I didn't want to throw any money at it, because I was, mm -hmm. anyone will take your money, pretty much. And I'm yeah. like, okay, well, I'm going to be very stingy and try these free options, and yeah. wasn't really getting getting too far with those. Um, but what I did find was that in 2017, most of my sales are were from face-to-face -face events. Hmm. And what I'm finding, so then 2018 became the year of event, event, event. I'm going to go to conferences, I'm going to go to hmm. community events, you know, Fondue Fest, the Wine Walk. Yes. Um, and I'm actually finding that events where that are not necessarily book-focused, these just wide events where there's other crafters and food vendors and things, I'm selling more books at those. Hmm. So is that because... Yeah. 
there's not as much competition. There's not yeah. two people on either side of me selling books. Yeah. Or or is it just the sheer number of people that go to a community event versus a book related event? Mm -hmm. huh. So those are the things I have to I have to think through. But I definitely know. I can safely say that if you sell books at an event where people are drinking wine, you will sell more books. <laughs> That's that is what I have learned. People are a little bit more liberal with their spending once they've been, you know, had a few libations. So, <laughs> so, so, or if you're going to have an event as an author, give away free wine. I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. Don't. You know, please consult your attorney. I'll see you. Right. Sorry. Good point. Good. Point. <laughs> Got to research. <laughs> so we've been talking to David Michael Williams. Uh, thanks for coming in today. Yeah, it was a pleasure. And if somebody has any questions, uh, how should they contact you? Um, probably my website, david-michael-williams.com. I have a contact form there. Or shoot me a direct message through social media. Um, yeah, I, I love connecting with people. I love learning from others. And I certainly will share what I know. And, and hopefully that will be of value to someone. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to be on Author Showcase, please contact us on our Facebook page or at Oshkosh Author Showcase at gmail.com. Otherwise, continue the conversation with Dixie and Tom via social media. Look for Dixie by searching for Daisy Jericho, and please check out her books, The Love Thief and Sparks Fly on Amazon. You can find Tom Cannon on many types of social media, and please check out his book on Amazon, The Tower of Apathy. Our goal is to introduce local authors around Oshkosh and hear their stories. We want to thank the Oshkosh Public Library and the Friends of Oshkosh Public Library for supporting the creation of this show. If you are a writer and are looking for a community, we suggest the Oshkosh Area Writers Club and the Lakefly Writers Conference held each May. 